هل من مفرج غير الله قل سبحان الله هو الله كل عباد له وكل بأمره قائم Very beautiful indeed. Thank you very much, Miss Sarah Hosni. What a beautiful voice. Ladies and gentlemen, we are carrying on with one of the most exciting books out there, one of the two most exciting books, God Passes By. The first most exciting book I'm sure you know of mine is The Dawnbreakers. God Passes By comes in a very close second. And third is The Very Hungry Caterpillar, a great story about this caterpillar who eats his way through the week. Um, I only got to Wednesday and I didn't get to finish that. But we are going to continue with our journey. Last session, we looked at a lot of the bulk of the writings of the Bab, and I gave this brief overview of the Bayan, which I'll go into in just a moment. But we know that whilst the Bab was up in Marku, so if we look at our map over here, you know that Marku is in the northwest of Iran, all the way up here. So the Bab has been put in prison in Marku. He's also in Chehreg, just south of there. So we know whilst the Bab is there, we know that he reveals over 500,000 verses purely in Marku. That's just in Marku, 500,000 verses. We know he touched on various themes such as prayers, homilies, doctrinal dissertations, exhortations, commentaries, epistles. He came up with a bunch of other books like the Dalai Saber, the Chasayel Saber, the commentary on the Surah of Val Ashr, looking at this first letter of Vav. I think it's a 200 page document on this one letter, on that alone. So a whole host of books, and of course, the weighty, the Persian Bayan as well. I went into a little bit of detail last week about the Persian Bayan. The brief overview is this. The Persian Bayan has about 8,000 words, nine varheads of 19 chapters. The last one only has 10. The reason why it only has 10 is because this book is meant to be continued by him whom God shall make manifest. And we believe Baha'u'llah did this in the Kitab Egan. This is the continuation of the Bayan. We know that it abrogates certain laws of Islam and changes them slightly, such as fasting, such as prayer, marriage, divorce, inheritance. Doesn't get rid of them at all, but there are some slight changes made to them. Obviously, they're very dear, um, these things, but the, when the Bab comes, he, he brings about this subtle change. He also upholds Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as indeed the one who he claims to be, and also for Christ. Talks about their validity and absolutely backs them up, of course. Sayyid Ali Muhammad, the Bab was born into a uh, Muslim family. He was a Muslim as Baha'is and Babis. Very much the faith of Islam is our cornerstone as well. And when we absolutely honor and revere this, in this, the Bab interprets such themes as the idea of paradise, as hell, death, the resurrection, the balance, the last hour, judgment day, this idea of judgment day, which I've spoken previously about. These are some of the things it covers. It also has a whole bunch of laws, but primarily it's a eulogy to him who God shall make manifest. And that's what this entire book is doing, trying to turn people's head towards him whom God will make manifest. Of course, we know the Bab had this twofold mission. One was to bring in his faith, and, uh, and really it was like this groundbreaking thing that he was bringing in, but also be this bridge from Islam to the Baha'i faith. And he even goes as far as saying that if people were to believe in him, but not to believe in Baha'u'llah, that would sorely displease him. He says someone wasn't to believe in him, but were to believe in Baha'u'llah, then they've achieved the goal. So this is the thing. The whole point is to turn people to the coming of his holiness, Baha'u'llah. We look at the third Vahed of this book. The third Vahed has this beautiful quote that says, Well is it with him who fixes his gaze on the order of Baha'u'llah and rendereth thanks unto his Lord, for he will assuredly be made manifest. God hath irrevocably ordained is in the Bayan. So he mentions the name Baha'u'llah in that as well. We know that Baha'u'llah in the Kitab Abadi talks about the Bab and how the Bab, for the first time ever really, in explicit language in such detail, talks about the manifestation of God that will come after him. He really gives so many signs. He talks about the year nine 
obviously the year zero for the Bab is the year 1844 when his revelation started. So he talks about how in the year nine something great is going to happen. And we know that nine years after 1844, 1853 is when His Holiness Baha'u'llah received his vision in the Siachal, in the Black Pit while in prison. So that was a turning point right there. He also mentions the year 19 as well and gives many quotes and says that Baha'u'llah will effectively come to light then, which he, of course, fulfills as Baha'is would believe. Then we know the Bab sends the letter of the living out to Miller Bagir. He said to him very specifically that you will meet Baha'u'llah, to someone by the name of Sayer, who later on goes to the fort of Sheikh Tabasi, once many people have been massacred and collects the dust. There's, there's this beautiful story that comes with this uh, the chap Sayer. But to him, he says as well, you will attain the presence of him whom God shall make manifest. To Mullah Hussein, we know that the Bab had given the mission of going from Shiraz to Isfahan to Kashan to Gom to Tehran to Mashhad to go all around. But to him, he said, he will indeed meet him whom God shall make manifest. And of course, we have Sheikh Hassan Azunasi, who was the amanuensis of the Bab, the secretary of the Bab, up in Marku, up in this area here, who was also told he would attain the presence of Baha'u'llah. He was the one, remember, who went to Karbala, waited around, and he got married, so it didn't look dodgy. Great reason to get married. Uh, and then two years later, he then meets his holiness, Baha'u'llah. The final thing we dealt with was the conference of Badash, which is right over here. There were 81 souls who were present. And we know that there's uh, two reasons for this. One is to have a break from some of the laws of Islam. Again, not that Islam is bad, that we need to do away with it, or not at all. As I say, the love that we have for Islam is, it's our faith as well. But there are some changes. As any prophet comes, there are changes that are made and things progress forward as the time so dictates. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason was this reason to try and free the Bab. People were talking about going to free the Bab from Marku. However, this did not happen. We'll look a little bit into that a little bit later as we, as we go on. I'll, I'll bring that up again. And then the conference of Adashta itself, we know that there was Tahereh, there was Baha'u'llah, and there was Goddus. And there were these three gardens. Goddus eventually sees Tahereh, who comes in with her veil off, which is so blasphemous. Abdul Khaleh Yazdi, one of the disciples, one of the 80, 81 people there, ends up slitting his throat. He's so well blown away by this thing. Uh, some of the people end up leaving the Babi faith. They say, no, it's too much for me. Some of the people see Godus's lead, who seemingly gets angry and is about to strike Tahereh's head. Some of them are with him, some of them are with Tahereh. The Hawla masterfully brings these two together. We find out that this entire thing was actually a drama. As in the Dawnbreak, as the Guardian mentions, he says it's a sublime drama. God passes by and mentions it as well. It's a sublime drama that's taking place. So this whole thing was actually put together as a drama to allow people to first react and be like, huh, what's happening? No, 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 I'm with him, I'm with her. And then slowly it's all brought together. We are ready to go on to our next chapter. The next chapter is going to be about the upheavals in Mazandaran, in Nairiz, and in Zanjan. So if we're going to understand a little bit about this, Mazandaran, just so we know, is the province where I'm circling, so just north of Tehran. And this is where His Holiness Baha'u'llah was born. He was born in a place called Nur, just over here. We know that the battle of Fort Sheikh Tabasi takes place in Mazandaran. We know another one of the battles is in this place here called Nairiz. And the third and final of these three huge battles takes place in Zanjan. We're going to go into this. We're going to try and look at some of the details and unravel this as much as we can. I'd like to welcome you to this journey and we're going to get stuck in and we're going to get infused. So if Miss Yvette Hakim is there, I would like to ask her possibly to kick us off with the writings here. The Bob's captivity in a remote corner of Azerbaijan, immortalized by the proceedings of the Conference of Badasht and distinguished by such notable developments as the public declaration of his mission, the formulation of the laws of his dispensation and the establishment of his covenant was to acquire added significance to the dire convulsions that sprang from the acts of both his adversaries and his disciples. The commotions that ensued as the years of that captivity drew to a close and that culminated in his own martyrdom called forth a degree of heroism on the part of his followers and a fierceness of hostility on the part of his enemies, which had never been witnessed during the first three years of his ministry. Indeed, this brief but most turbulent period may be rightly regarded as the bloodiest and most dramatic of the heroic age of the Baha'i era. The momentous happenings associated with the Bob's incarceration in Mahku and Shri, constituting as they did the high watermark of his revelation, 
could have no other consequence than to fan to fiercer flame both the fervor of his lovers and the fury of his enemies. A persecution grimmer, more odious, and more shrewdly calculated than any which Hussein Khan or even Haji Mirza Ahasi had, in, had kindled was soon to be unchained, to be accompanied by a corresponding manifestation of heroism unmatched by any of the earliest outbursts of enthusiasm that had greeted the birth of the faith in either Shiraz or Esfahan. This period of ceaseless and unprecedented commotion was to rob that faith in quick succession of its chief protagonists, was to attain its climax in the extinction of the life of its author, and was to be followed by a further and this time an almost complete elimination of its eminent supporters, with the sole exception of one who at its darkest hour was entrusted through the dispensations of providence with the dual function of saving a sorely stricken faith from annihilation and of ushering in the dispensation destined to supersede it. The formal assumption by the Bab of the authority of the promised Ryan in such dramatic circumstances and in so challenging a tone before a distinguished gathering of eminent Shia ecclesiastics, powerful, jealous, alarmed and hostile was the explosive force that loosed a veritable avalanche of calamities which swept down upon the faith and the people among whom it was born. It raised to fervid heat the zeal that glowed in the souls of the Bob's scattered disciples, who were already incensed by the cruel captivity of their leader, and whose ardor was now further inflamed by the outpourings of his pen, which reached them unceasingly from the place of his confinement. It provoked a heated and prolonged controversy throughout the length and breadth of the land in bazaars, masjids, madrasas, and other public places, deepening thereby the cleavage that had already sundered its people. Muhammad Shah, at so perilous an hour, was meanwhile rapidly sinking under the weight of his physical infirmities. The shallow-minded Haji Mirza Aasi, now the pivot of state affairs, exhibited a vacillation and incompetence that seemed to increase with every extension in the range of his grave responsibilities. At one time, he would feel inclined to support the verdict of the ulamas. At another, he would censure their aggressiveness and distrust their assertions. At yet another, he would relapse into mysticism and wrapped in his reveries, lose sight of the gravity of the emergency that confronted him. So glaring a mismanagement of national affairs, emboldened the clerical order whose members were now hurling with malignant zeal anthemas from their pulpits and were vociferously inciting superstitious congregations to take up arms against the upholders of a much hated creed, to insult the honor of their women folk, to plunder their property and harass and injure their children. What of the signs and prodigies they thundered before countless assemblies that must needs usher in the advent of the Ghayan what of the major and minor occultations? What of the cities of Jabulka and Jabulsa? How are we to explain the sayings of Hussein ibn Ru? And what interpretation should be given to the authenticated traditions ascribed to Ibn Mihriyar? Where are the men of the unseen who are to traverse in a week the whole surface of the earth? What of the conquest of the east and west which the Ghaim is to effect on his appearance? Where is the one-eyed antichrist and the ass on which he is to mount? What of Sufyan and his dominion? Are we, they noiselessly remonstrated, are we to account as a dead letter the indubitable, the unnumbered traditions of our holy imams? Or are we to extinguish with fire and sword this brazen heresy that has dared to lift its head in our land? To these defamations, threats and protestations, the learned and resolute champions of a misrepresented faith following the example of their leader, opposed unhesitatingly treaties, commentaries, and refutations, assiduously written, cogent in their argument, replete with testimonies, lucid, eloquent, and convincing, affirming their belief in the prophethood of Muhammad, in the legitimacy of the Imams, in the spiritual sovereignty of the Sahabu Zaman, the Lord of the Age, interpreting in a masterly fashion the obscure, the designedly allegorical and abstruse traditions, verses, and prophecies in the Islamic holy writ and adducing in support of their contention. 
the meekness and apparent helplessness of the Imam Hussein, who despite his defeat, his discomfiture, and ignominious martyrdom, had been hailed by their antagonists as the very embodiment and the matchless symbol of God's all-conquering sovereignty and power. This time period that the Guardian trying to get across to us is a very, very different time period indeed. The first few years of the Bab's ministry, essentially, were, yes, they were, they were bad. Yes, we had Hussein Khan in Shiraz, remember, who was this alcoholic womanizer, the governor of Shiraz, who had the Bab slapped, who had the Bab imprisoned, and came up with this plan to go and kidnap the Bab, where they go into his house, they try and take him, and all of a sudden there's this cholera outbreak. The Bab then goes to uh, this guy's house, he sees his son's dying, gives him his ablution water, saves his son, and then he's sent out from Shiraz. Agassi, the prime minister, was also involved in this. They were trying to clamp down on the Bab. So there were things that were happening that were not cool. We know the Bab then goes on to Isfahan, a similar things happen with a guy called Gherkin, and he's heading all the way up to Tehran, and Haji Mizar Agassi is terrified that his holiness the Bab is going to meet the king in case the king may actually become a Babi. And then what happens with the power? We know the Bab had this book, the Gayum al Azma, where in here he talks about the sovereign should divest their power that actually power should be God's and things should be treated equally. A lot of corruption was around at the time, as there is in every country, and there was at the time, and there is now. Not that Iran singled out for corruption, but there's corruption all around us. So his holiness, the Bab has come to change this. We know that the Bab was imprisoned for so long. But even that, those first few years were nothing compared to this next set of time. When the Bab is in Marku, this is where he's super explicit about being the Ga'em. Before that, he had said that he was the Ga'em, but people thought that maybe he was the gate that was going to speak to the, the Ga'em. As I've said, we have 12 Imams in Shia Islam, and the 12th one is the one who supposedly disappears. There were four people that were speaking to him, and uh, the fourth one says, not for a thousand years will the Ga'em appear. Apparently, people thought that the Bab was claiming to be the fifth one talking to the Ga'em. He wasn't. He was claiming to be the guy. And this is where in Marku, this is where he starts making this explicit. As a result of this, people start getting terrified. They, they really get very scared. They realize that actually the claim is so much bigger. So they don't really know what to do. This is when now things start turning and the persecutions are about to get crazy. We know that Muhammad Shah, who's the king at the time, he was very sick and had certain frailties. We know that Haji Mirza Agassi, who was the prime minister of Muhammad Shah, he was a bit of a flip-flopper. Sometimes he was with the clergy trying to get at the Babis. Sometimes he was into mysticism. He was kind of all over the place from what we're reading in this text. We then go into this passage, which talks about people now trying to attack and say, look, okay, the Bab is claiming to be the Ga'em, but what about some of the signs and, and the prophecies? And this is where we'll pause, and it's interesting to look at prophecies that are there. Some of them will be fulfilled, some of them won't be fulfilled. And in the Bible dispensation, there's this concept of a badar. And part of badar is you can choose not to fulfill some of them. Also, some of these prophecies come from these traditions and these, these hadiths that maybe are not quite founded in as much reality as, as they should be. So there are these reported sayings, and some of them haven't really been confirmed as such. But a lot of these things can be found in this book known as Bihar. And this Bihar takes the uh, reported sayings of the sixth Imam, uh, Jafar Sareg, and his father, Bagar, and it really takes a lot of these things, and it, it talks about some of the supposed prophecies. We know about this, the major and the minor occultation. So what does this refer to? This refers to what I was saying earlier on, when the Ga Emich reported that when he was six years old, so we have the 11, we have the 11 Imams, when the Ga Emich is six years old, and he goes into hiding for 70 years. But for these 70 years, he's communing with these four gates, these four people who's having communication with him. This is known as the minor occultation. After these four pass away and there is no one else communicating, that's when it's said that he's in the major occultation. So he's, he's hiding. Now, now, where is he? He's in these two cities, the cities of Jabulga and Jabulsa. Jabulga is described as a place with a thousand gates, and it's got all like the best food in the world and the rest of it. Jabulsa is another place that's similar, that has all the most worthy believers and everything, and there are these two incredible places that the Ga'em apparently is traversing between. 
So people are saying, well, what about the cities of Jabal Ghan and Jabalsa? What about the major and minor architecture? There's all these questions about what's going on. How are we to explain the sayings of Hussein Ibn Ruh and Ibn Mihyar, who again, Ibn Mihyar was, I think, taking from a lot of these traditions that was in the Bihar and was kind of remixing some of them from what I understand. I don't know how seriously to take everything that he says. But there are these questions that come up. And it's interesting, on Jabal Ghan and Jabalsa, Baha'u'llah, in a lot of his later tablets, explains that these places are not really real places. This isn't actually what's happened as such. But in his earlier writings, he kind of takes these concepts and he says, yes, okay, these places, they exist. And, you know, every manifestation comes from them. There are these prophecies that actually the Imam Mehdi will be the son of Hassan. So Hassan is the 11th Imam and he'd be the son of Hassan. Baha'u'llah says that all the prophets are actually the son of Hassan. All the prophets come from Jabal Ghan and Jabal Sa, and he ends up explaining these as heavenly places in a sense. You know, this metaphorical explanation he gives that they're drawing this information from them and all good things come from them and he's sharing this with us. So there's a lot of things here that we can look at and go into. There's other beautiful traditions as well, which maybe a little bit later I'll go into. But people are asking some of these questions and they're saying, we don't understand. Where is this? Where is that? And what happens? The Barbies decide to respond. They respond really well and they give out these treaties. But, and there's a saying in Farsi, in Persian, that if you're pretending to be asleep, you can't wake someone up. If someone's pretending to be asleep, you cannot wake them up. You can shake them as much as you want. They're not interested. We look here, it talks about the one eyed Antichrist and the ass on which he is the mount. So, who is this one eyed Antichrist? Well, apparently, it's Haji Mirza Karim Khan, who we know had one eye. And as for the ass that he's meant to be sitting on, that was the, uh, the Qajar dynasty. That's the way it's explained. And so anyway, there's all these things that are sort of popping up. But again, if people don't want to know, if they don't want to understand, eh, they're not going to understand. It's not going to happen. So as I say, the Barbies responded, cogent in their argument, with lucid, eloquent, and convincing uh, testimonies. But if people don't want to understand, they're not going to understand. I'm a bit confused. We are in chapter three, right? Because the versions I have on nine is different. Is that normal? Chapter three has always been about the upheavals in Mazinderan and Nairis. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So that's where we should be. If you're somewhere else, maybe God is transporting you to somewhere else you need to be. Maybe it's a magical, mystical thing. But yeah, I think it's just uh, the, the upheavals. For me here, it says uh, the declaration of the Bab's mission on chapter three. That's not the dawnbreakers you're looking at, by any chance. Yeah, it's, it's the Dawnbreakers. The Dawnbreakers you're looking at, that's probably why, yeah. A student of both the Dawnbreakers and God Passes By, that's why she's getting confused. Too much information. Oh, where are we? It's the, that God Passes By. Hello, welcome. My name's Dave Kayani. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> we're in the year 2020. It, today. It is God Passes By, absolutely. Oh, okay, so that, okay, and... Okay. Awesome, 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 awesome. Are you sure? It's not supposed to be Dawnbreakers today? I'm very sure, yes. Yes, sorry, okay, I'm going to go. Yes, thank you. Um, sorry, so were we, I think we were here, the fierce, is that, is, that, is that where we were? Yes. This fierce nationwide controversy had assumed alarming proportions when Muhammad Shah finally succumbed to his illness, precipitating by his death the downfall of his favorite and all-powerful minister, Haji Mirza Aghasi, who soon stripped of the treasures he had amassed, fell into disgrace and was expelled from the capital and sought refuge in Karbala. The 17 year old Nasir Din Mirza ascended the throne, leaving the direction of affairs to the obdurate, the iron hearted Amir Nizam, Mirza Taghi Khan, who without consulting his fellow ministers, decreed that immediate and condign punishment be inflicted on the hapless Babis. Governors, magistrates, and civil servants throughout the provinces, instigated by the monstrous campaign of vilification conducted by the clergy and prompted by their lust for pecuniary rewards, vied in their respective spheres with each other in hounding and heaping indignities on the adherence of an outlawed faith. For the first time in the faith's history, a systematic campaign in which the civil 
and ecclesiastical powers were bounded together was being launched against it. A campaign that was to culminate in the horrors experienced by Baha'u'llah in the Siacha of Tehran and his subsequent banishment to Iraq. Government, clergy, and people arose as one man to assault and exterminate their common enemy. In remote and isolated centers, the scattered disciples of a persecuted community were pitilessly struck down by the sword of their foes. While in centers where large numbers had congregated, measures were taken in self-defense, which misconstrued by a cunning and deceitful adversary, served in their turn to inflame still further the hostility of the authorities and multiply the outrages perpetrated by the oppressors. In the east, at Sheikh Tabarsi, in the south, in Neiriz, in the west, in Zanjan, and in the capital itself, massacres, upheavals, demonstrations, engagements, sieges, acts of treachery proclaimed in rapid succession the violence of the storm which had broken out and exposed the bankruptcy and blackened annals of a proud yet degenerate people. The audacity of Mullah Hossein, who at the command of the Bab had attired his head with the green turban worn and set to him by his master, who had hoisted the black standard the unfurling of which would, according to the Prophet Muhammad, herald the advent of the vice uh, gerent of God on earth and who mounted on his steed, was marching at the head of 202 of his fellow disciples to meet and lend his, his assistance to Qudus and the Jazire Qadra, Verdant Isle, his audacity was the signal of a clash, the reverberations of it, which were to resound through the entire country. The contest lasted no less than 11 months. Its theater was for the most part the forest of Mazandaran. Its heroes were the flower of the Babi's disciples. Its martyrs comprise no less than half of the letters of the living, not excluding Quadus and Mola Hossein, respectively the last and the first of these letters. The directive force, which however unobtrusively sustained, it was none other than that which flowed from the mind of Baha'u'llah. It was caused by the unconcealed determination of the dawnbreakers of a new age to proclaim fearlessly and befittingly its advent, and by a no less unyielding resolve, should persuasion prove a failure to resist and defend themselves against the onslaughts of malicious and unreasoning assailants. It demonstrated beyond the shadow of a doubt what the indomitable spirit of a band of 313 untrained, unequipped, yet God-intoxicated students, mostly sedentary recluses of the college and cloister, could achieve when pitted in self-defense against a trained army, well-equipped, supported by the masses of the people, blessed by the clergy, headed by a prince of the royal blood, backed by the resources of the state, acting with the enthusiastic approval of its sovereign, and animated by the unfailing counsels of a resolute and all-powerful minister. Its outcome was a heinous betrayal ending in an orgy of slaughter, staining with everlasting infamy its perpetrations, investing its victims 
with a halo of imperishable glory and generating the very seeds which in a later age were to blossom into worldwide administrative institutions and which must in the fullness of time yield their golden fruit in the shape of a world redeeming earth encircling order. It will be unnecessary to attempt even an abbreviated narrative of this tragic episode, however grave its import, however much misconstrued by adverse chronicles and historians. A glance over its salient features will suffice for the purpose of these pages. We note, as we conjure up the events of this great tragedy, the fortitude, the intrepidity, the discipline, and the resourcefulness of its heroes, contrasting sharply with the turpitude, the cowardice, the disorderliness, and the inconstancy of their opponents. We observe the sublime patience, the noble restraint exercised by one of its principal actors, the lion-hearted Mullah Hussein, who persistently refused to unsheathe his sword until an armed and angry multitude, uttering the foulest invectives, had gathered at a Farsang's distance from Bar Fouge to block his way and had mortally struck down seven of his innocent and staunch companions. We are filled with admiration for the tenacity of faith of that same Mullah Hussein, demonstrated by his resolve to persevere in sounding the Adhan while besieged in the caravanserai of Sapsenaidon. Though three of his companions, who had successively ascended to the roof of the inn with the express purpose of performing that sacred rite, had been instantly killed by the bullets of the enemy. We marvel at the spirit of renunciation that prompted those sore pressed sufferers to contemptuously ignore the possessions left behind by their fleeing enemy that led them to discard their own belongings and content themselves with their seats and swords that induced the father of Badi, one of the, that gallant company, to fling unhesitatingly by the roadside the satchel full of turquoises, which he had bought from his father's mine in Nishapur, that led Mirza Muhammad Tariyad Juvani to cast away a sum equivalent in the value in silver and gold, and impelled those same companions to disdain and refuse even to touch the costly furnishings and the coffers of gold and silver, which the demoralized and shame-laden Prince Mehdi Goli Mirza, the commander of the army of Mazandaran and a brother of Muhammad Shah, had left behind in his headlong fling from his camp. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nisa. Let's pause there. Quite a chunk we've covered there's so much detail. There's so much detail to go through. The Prime Minister was Agassi. He's gone into nothingness. He's in Karbala. He's just out of a job, totally out of it. Enter the one and only Mirza Taghi Khan. Now, he is the new Prime Minister. When he comes in, he wants to show his power and he wants to take some action and he wants to get Brexit done, as we'd say in the UK. He wants to make a change. So he decides that he's actually going to try and punish the Bab and cause all sorts of problems. And also, these attacks that start then kicking off. We know the attacks in Nairiz, as I mentioned, in the fort of Sheikh Tabasi and in Zanjan. The Guardian then talks briefly about Mullah Hussein marching with these black standards. Now, in this book that I mentioned earlier, this Bihar, these, these traditions, it talks about how people will march from the east to the west 
with this black standard and he will come with 202 disciples. Mullah Hussein, whilst in Mashhad, decides to set out and he's heading towards the West. Now again, this is a prophecy that this would happen from the east to the west, and actually the Umayyad dynasty, who were very big and powerful, and they reached their peak in the year 666, and I think Abdul Baha talks about this, and they were very corrupt in a lot of problems. The Abbasis, who were another group, they decide to do this march from Mashhad, going across, and this is how they actually overthrow the Umayyad. So this was used before. But here, this is a totally different thing. This is about the coming of the Ga'em, and this prophecy that from Mashhad, people will walk to the area of Mesopotamia, as it was, this is going back, and they would go and they would come to this verdant isle. And they would go to the verdant isle and they would make this great announcement of the coming of the Ga'im. So what's happening here? We've got Mullah Sain who's traveling now. He doesn't start off with 202 disciples. He goes, and as he goes on the way, we know he goes to Neshapur, which is here, which is where Badi, who's mentioned Badi's father's from. And slowly, slowly, like a bus, they're collecting people as they're going along. They're going closer and closer and closer, heading towards a town called Barfarush, which today is known as Babul. So you'll see we've got this town Babul here. So as they're coming up there, Mullah Hussain encounters the Sayyid Ulama, the big chief in town who he'd met once previously, who decides that he wants to rally up the city and ascends the pulpit and calls all the people in the city round and he says, we must kill these people, they're heretics, they're coming to stamp us out. He rips his shirt open, probably a lot of hair, he was Persian. He rips his shirt open and he says, come on people, we've got to attack these Barbies. So the Bab is in prison, okay? The Bab's up in prison uh, uh, in the corner and Mullah Hussain is going. Another reason they're going as well is to go and get Goddus to also be one of the leaders. Now, Goddus, there's this tradition which is incredible that talks about the second Ga'em. All right, so we've got the Ga'em, the Imam Mehdi, but the second Ga'em that will come from Gilan. And this is a reference to Goddus. So they're going to actually enlist the help of Goddus, who at the time was in Sahari. As they're approaching, this is where the Sayyid Ulama basically decides that they're going to block these Barbies coming through with their black, with their black standards. Six of them are killed. Six of them are killed. And then they say to uh, Mullah Hussain, look, can we, can we defend ourselves? Can we do something now? And he says, no, not until the seventh one is killed. And people are confused. But then we realize that the Ba'ab's name, Sayyid Ali Muhammad, Ali Muhammad is exactly seven letters long. So we were saying each killing was meant to be a sacrifice for the Ba'ab. When the seventh one is killed, that's when we know the story of Mullah Hussain going through with his sword, chopping the man, the musket, and the tree in three pieces. We then have the story where there's the prayer. Mullah Hussain says, we must do the azan. So they stand up. The first one stands up, the first barbie. Bang, he's killed. The second one is killed. The third one is killed until it's, until it's finished. So we have this constant sacrifice thing that's happening. But it's amazing that they're going to this verdant isle, this prophecy that's being fulfilled. Actually, this verdant isle, verdant, I think, from, the, is it from French, verd means green. Um, so it's this green place now, Mazandaran. Fort Sheikh Tabasi is what's known as this Jazira Khazra. So this verdant isle is this area here. There's lots of trees, as you can see, it's quite green here. So they're going there, and this is one of the, one of the prophecies, actually, that's being fulfilled by them going there. Quite remarkable, but that, that's where they're going. 202 people, watch the significance of 202. I can hear you all saying, we know what this is, Dave. It must be something to do with the Abjad system that you keep on mentioning, where A is one, B is two, blah, 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 blah. Well, strangely enough, 202 is the Abjad for Ali Muhammad. If you take the Barb's name, Sayyid Ali Muhammad, you will see that if you add the value of the letters up, that comes to 202. The amount of people that are going there as they're entering is 202. And another level as well, the term for Lord, Rab in Arabic, is 202. So it's interesting, this whole... Ali Muhammad is the Lord. He's actually coming in and is, is speaking as, as the mouthpiece of God. And you've got the number 202. So again, the numbers, there's a great significance to each and every one of these things. So they go to their verdant isle. We know then this battle ensues. And it talks about this battle that happens in uh, Sheikh Tabar. Sorry to interrupt. I just don't understand all these numbers things. Maybe I've missed something from previous talk. But what, what, is, what is all this, the numbers coinciding with letters, please? Sure. Very briefly, Sandra. The letter A, for example, has the value of one because it's the first letter in the alphabet. The letter B has a value of two. So if you take, for example, the name of the Bab, which consists of B, A, B. So if B is two and A is one, you'll see B, which is two, plus one, A, plus another two makes five. 
If you take Baha yes. for Baha'u'llah, if you add the letters there, it comes to nine. So it's just a, a very interesting way that they would do things where each word would have a value. And there's a significance to this. In the West, we don't really use this. So it gets a little bit complicated. So I understand why you're asking the question. But if you were to take the value of the letters, if you imagine like it's Scrabble almost, where the, the letters have a number, have a value. If you were to take those, yeah. the, the, the value, then you'd see, okay, this 202 equals Ali Muhammad. It also equals the word rap. R, I think, is 200 and B is, is 2. So it makes 202. It's a kind of complicated thing. Don't get stuck on it too much. The point is there's, there's a lot of significance that's there. We know that the whole thing was, uh, a lot of this was being directed by Baha'u'llah because obviously in the prison was the Bab. So Baha'u'llah was there and he was, he even went to the fort of Sheikh Tabasi to make sure the fort was in good stead and then secure up the fort and gave a bunch of uh, advice as to, as to what should happen at the fort. And we know that half the letters of the living were killed in the battle of Fort Sheikh Tabasi. Half of them, including Godus and Mullah Hussein which as a result of this, the Bab didn't eat or drink for nine days or something. He didn't meet anyone for five months. He didn't be tate or write or anything. He was absolutely distraught. Such was his love for God Dusan Mullah. So we know that the Sheikh Tabasi battle takes place as well. So this is what it's talking about. This is all the things that it's trying to, trying to bring in together. And, and the Guardian is, is touching upon these things. And I don't think we're done, actually, with the things that it goes through. We cannot but esteem the passionate sincerity with which Mullah Hussein pleaded with the prince and the formal assurance he gave him, disclaiming in no uncertain terms any intention on his part or that of his fellow disciples of usurping the authority of the Shah or of subverting the foundations of his state. We cannot but view with contempt the conduct of that arch villain, the hysterical, the cruel and overbearing Said al-Ulama, who, alarmed at the approach of those same companions, flung in a frenzy of excitement and before an immense crowd of men and women, his turban to the ground, tore open the neck of his shirt and, bewailing the plight into which Islam had fallen, implored his congregation to fly to arms and cut down the approaching band. We are struck with wonder as we contemplate the superhuman prowess of Mullah Hussein, which enabled him notwithstanding his fragile frame and trembling hand, to slay a treacherous foe who had taken shelter behind a tree by cleaving with a single stroke of his sword the tree, the man and his musket in twain. We are stirred, moreover, by the scene of the arrival of Baha'u'llah at the fort and the indefinable joy it imparted to Mullah Hussein, the reverent reception accorded him by his fellow disciples, his inspection of the fortifications which they had hurriedly erected for their protection, and the advice he gave them, which resulted in the miraculous deliverance of Qudus in his subsequent and close association with the defenders of that fort, and then his effective participation in the exploits connected with its siege and eventual destruction. We are amazed at the sincerity and sagacity of that same Qudus, the confidence he instilled on his arrival, the resourcefulness he displayed, the fervour and gladness with which the besieged listened at morn and at eventide to the voice intoning the verses of his celebrated commentary of the Sard of Samad, to which he had already, while in Sari, devoted a treatise thrice as voluminous as the Quran itself, and which he was now, despite the tumultuary attacks of the enemy and the privations he and his companions were enduring, further elucidating by adding to that interpretation as many verses as he had previously written. We remember with thrilling hearts that memorable encounter when, at the cry, mount your steeds, O heroes of God, Mullah Hussein, accompanied by 202 of the beleaguered and sorely distressed companions, and preceded by Qudus, emerged before daybreak from the fort and raising the shout of, Ya Sahibu Zaman rushed at full charge towards the stronghold of the prince and penetrated to his private apartments, only to find that, in his consternation, he had thrown himself from a back window into the moat and escaped barefooted, leaving his host confounded and rooted. We see relieved in poignant memory that last day of Mullah Hussein's earthly life, when soon after midnight, 
having performed his ablutions, clothed himself in new garments and attired his head with the barb's turban. He mounted his charger, ordered the gate of the fort to be open, rode out at the head of 313 of his companions, shouting aloud, Ya Sahibu Zaman, charged successively the seven barricades erected by the enemy, captured every one of them, notwithstanding the bullets that were raining upon him, swiftly dispatched their defenders and had scattered their forces when, in the ensuing tumult, his steed became suddenly entangled in the rope of a tent and before he could extricate himself, was struck in the breast by a bullet which the cowardly Abbas Guli Khan el Larijani had discharged while lying in ambush in the branches of a neighboring tree. We acclaim the magnificent courage that, in a subsequent encounter, inspired 19 of those stout-hearted companions to plunge headlong into the camp of an enemy that consisted of no less than two regiments of infantry and cavalry, and to cause such consternation that one of their leaders, the same Abbas Guli Khan, falling from his horse, and leaving in his distress one of his boots hanging from the stirrup, ran away, half shod and bewildered, to the prince and confessed the ignominious reverse he had suffered. Nor can we fail to note the superb fortitude with which these heroic souls bore the load of their severe trials, when their food was at first reduced to the flesh of horses brought away from the deserted camp of their enemy. When later they had to content themselves with such grass as they could snatch from the fields whenever they obtained a respite from their besiegers. When they were forced at a later stage to consume the bark of the trees and the leather of their saddles, of their belts, of their scabbards and of their shoes. When during 18 days they had nothing but water of which they drank a mouthful every morning. When the cannon fire of the enemy compelled them to dig subterranean passages within the fort, where, dwelling amid mud and water, with garments rotting away with damp, they had to subsist on ground-up bones. And when at last, oppressed by gnawing hunger, they, as attested by a contemporary chronicler, were driven to disinter the steed of their venerated leader, Mullah Hussein, cut it into pieces, grind into dust its bones, mix it with the putrefied meat and making it into a stew, avidly devour it. Let me make this very clear, sorry, what these battles are. It's not that the Barbies want to go and battle people and they want to go and fight people. The Barbies are proclaiming that the Ga'em has returned. They are proclaiming this new mission. What ends up happening is people start to attack them. The Barbies are trying to defend themselves. This is why they take refuge in the fort of Sheikh Tabasi, in the fort of Ali Mahdam, and they're basically trying to protect themselves. The government send people to surround them and cut off their food supplies. This is what's happening, as well as be firing at them. So the Barbies every now and again need to go outside and they need to go and get food. Goddus, who was this inspiring, phenomenal light, who would eventually uh, join, he was in Sari for a while, and there's a beautiful passage about him joining, he starts writing a commentary on the Sad Samad, S, the letter Sad. And this apparently is three times the size of the Holy Quran. Again, the Holy Quran, roughly six and a half thousand verses, give or take. And he writes three times this. So we're talking more or less 20,000 verses that he writes. And he starts reading this out and he's cheering people up as much as he can in these horrible conditions where there's no food, where there's no water, and they're really struggling. We hear about Mullah Hussain, who actually pleads with Godus and says, please let me be a martyr. Godus says, okay. Well, I say knew that he was going to be a martyr. I think that it was more this, not that he's like, let me die, I've had enough. It's like, you know, for his love. So Mullah Hussain goes out on his horse and he starts repelling the uh, horses that are besieging the, the fort. Lo and behold, his horse gets tangled um, in a rope from a tree. And then Larajani, Abbas Khali Khan, Larajani basically ends up shooting him in the, in the, in the breast. He then comes back to the, uh, to the forts. Godus, who had been shot in the mouth as well previously, just like the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when a stone is thrown at his tooth in a similar sort of fashion, there's this beautiful interaction between them. But Mullah Hussain just wants to know from Godus, are you pleased with me? That's the main thing he's, he's asking for. 
But if he's done enough to serve Kondus, and obviously serve the serve Baal. The conditions, as I said, were so bad, they would have to eat horses. They would have to eat grass. They would eat the bark off trees. Such was the desperation. They would eat the leather off their, of their shoes, of their belt. Imagine eating leather. But that's what they were doing. Such were the conditions. They were, they were so terrible. They even ended up having to disinter to dig up the horse of Mullah Hussein. Mullah Hussein, who they loved so much, and the horse, you know, has been buried in the ground out of respect. But things were so bad, they had to dig up the horse to try and eat the putrefied meat, making a stew, and then grounding down the bones to try and make some flour from this. There's an account of one of the barbies being cut in half, and you can see grass in their stomach. Horrendous conditions. Nor can reference be omitted to the abject treachery to which the impotent and discredited prince eventually resorted, and his violation of his so-called irrevocable oath, inscribed and sealed by him on the margin of the opening surah of the Quran, whereby he, swearing by that holy book, undertook to set free all the defenders of the fort, pledged his honor that no man in his army or in the neighborhood would molest them, and that he would himself, at his own expense, arrange for their safe departure to their homes. And lastly, we call to remembrance the final scene of that somber tragedy, when, as a result of the prince's violation of his sacred engagement, a number of the betrayed companions of Cordus were assembled in the camp of the enemy, were stripped of their possessions and sold as slaves, the rest being either killed by the spears and swords of the officers, or torn asunder, or bound to trees and riddled with bullets, or blown from the mouths of cannons and consigned to the flames, or else being disemboweled and having their heads impaled on spears and lances. Godus, their beloved leader, was by yet another shameful act of the intimidated prince, surrendered into the hands of the diabolical Sayyid ulama who, in his unquenchable hostility and aided by the mob whose passions he had sedulously inflamed, stripped his victim of his garments, loaded him with chains, paraded him through the streets of Barfarouche, and incited the scum of its female, inhabitants to execrate and spit upon him, assail him with knives and axes, mutilate his body, and throw the tattered fragments into a fire. This stirring episode, so glorious for the faith, so blackening to the reputation of its enemies, an episode which must be regarded as a rare phenomenon in the history of modern times, was soon succeeded by a parallel upheaval, strikingly similar in its essential features. The scene of woeful tribulations was now shifted to the south, to the province of Fars, not far from the city where the dawning light of the faith had broken. Nairiz and its environs were made to sustain the impact of this fresh ordeal in all its fury. The fort of Khadje, in the vicinity of the Chinar Suhte quarter of that hotly agitated village, became the storm center of the new conflagration. The hero who towered above his fellows valiantly struggled and fell a victim to its devouring flames was that unique and peerless figure of his age, the far-famed Sayyid Yahya Darabi, better known as Bahid. Foremost among his perfidious adversaries who kindled and fled the fire of this conflagration was the base and fanatical governor of Nairiz, Zainil Abedin Khan, seconded by Abdullah Khan, the Shajul Mulk, and reinforced by Prince Firuz Mirza, the governor of Shiraz of a much briefer duration than the Mazandaran upheaval, which lasted no less than 11 months, the atrocities that marked its closing stage were no less devastating in their consequences. Once again, a handful of men, innocent, law-abiding, peace-loving, yet high-spirited and indomitable, consisting partly in this case of untrained lads and men of advanced age, were surprised, challenged, encompassed, and assaulted by the superior force of a cruel and crafty enemy, an innumerable host of able-bodied men who, though well-trained, adequately equipped, and continually reinforced, were impotent, coerced into submission or subdue the spirit of their adversaries. This fresh commotion originated in declarations of faith as fearless and impassioned, and in demonstrations of religious enthusiasm almost as vehement and dramatic as those which had ushered in the Mazandaran upheaval. It was instigated by a no less sustained and violent outburst of uncompromising ecclesiastical hostility, it was accompanied by corresponding manifestations of blind religious fanaticism. It was provoked by similar acts of naked aggression on the part of both clergy and people. It demonstrated afresh the same purpose was animated throughout by the same spirit, 
and rose to almost the same height of superhuman heroism of fortitude, courage, and renunciation. It revealed a no less shrewdly calculated coordination of plans and efforts between the civil and ecclesiastical authorities designed to challenge and overthrow a common enemy. It was preceded by a similar categorical repudiation on the part of the Babis of any intention of interfering with the civil jurisdiction of the realm or of undermining the legitimate authority of its sovereign. It provided a no less convincing testimony to the restraint and forbearance of the victims in the face of the ruthless and unprovoked aggression of the oppressor. It exposed as it moved towards its climax and in hardly less striking a manner, the cowardice, the want of discipline and the degradation of a spiritually bankrupt foe. It was marked as it approached its conclusion by a treachery as vile and shameful. It ended in a massacre even more revolting in the horrors it evoked and the miseries it engendered. It sealed the fate of Vahid, who by his green turban, the emblem of his proud lineage, was bound to a horse and dragged ignominiously through the streets, after which his head was cut off, was stuffed with straw, and sent as a trophy to the feasting prince in Shiraz, while his body was abandoned to the mercy of the infuriated women of Nairiz who, intoxicated with barbarous joy by the shouts of exultation raised by a triumphant enemy, danced into the accompaniment of drums and cymbals around it. And finally, it brought in its wake with the aid of no less than 5,000 men, specially commissioned for this purpose, a general and fierce onslaught of the, on the defenseless Babis, whose possessions were confiscated, whose houses were destroyed, whose stronghold was burned to the ground, whose women and children were captured, and some of whom, stripped almost naked, were mounted on donkeys, mules, and camels, and led through rows of heads hewn from the lifeless bodies of their, fa their fathers, brothers, sons, and husbands, who previously had been either branded or had their nails torn out, or had been lashed to death, or had spikes hammered into their hands and feet, or had incisions made in their noses through which strings were passed, and by which they were led through the streets before the gaze of an irate and derisive multitude. We'll just pause there. It's really going through so many horrible, horrible details. Firstly, we're done with the battle that happens in, in Fort Sheikh Tavasi. That's, that's kind of brought to an end by the prince who they're, tr they're trying to attack the Barbies. They're trying to choke the Barbies out. They can't. Eventually, the prince says to Godus, he says, look, I swear on this holy Quran, I swear that if you guys come out, we will let you all go home and hey, I'll even pay for your expenses. It's like a holiday, guys. Don't worry about it. This is one big misunderstanding of these months that we've been killing you and trying to torture you. Don't worry about it. Go home. We swear on the Quran, we will not hurt you. Mullah Hussein has passed away. God does that. And God does has such love for the Quran and respect for the Quran that he knows full well what's about to happen. He knows that actually they're not being sincere. But he can't turn around and say no because it shows this disrespect for the Quran. And I think his respect for the Quran was so strong. So he ends up saying, fine, we will come out. Now, interestingly enough, Godus's mom had asked him roughly three years prior to this, Godus, when are you going to get married? A question that mothers sometimes ask, especially if you're Persian, you may get that asked every day. Um, but when are you going to get married? Okay. And Godus says, I will get married in three years. In three years time, I'm going to get married. And I'm going to get married in Barfurush, which, like I said, is now called Babel, and it's going to be a big marriage in the square. This is what he predicts. Anyway, so roughly three years on, as I say, they have this battle at Fort Sheikh Tabasi, and God does says, fine, we're going to come out, because they promised on the Quran, please come out, and they come out. So they come out. Now, many of the Babis are, are taken, they're tortured, they're strapped to cannons, and a cannonball is shot through their bodies. Usually they'd be tied up with their back face towards the cannon, one person says, I want to face the cannon so I can actually see the instrument that's going to kill me. Such is my love. I'm so blessed to have this instrument kill me. We know some of the heads are cut off. They're impaled on spears. Horrible atrocities happen to some of these people. But Godus, Godus is delivered into the hands of the Sayyid ulama. So the, so the, the big wig in the town of Barfurush. Remember the guy who ripped his shirt open and had this whole encounter with Mullah Hussein. He's delivered into his hands. He's taken. He's savagely beaten, knives, axes, he's chopped into pieces. The women are then told to execrate on him, to swear at him, to cut his body up into pieces after a mob has set upon him and then throw his body into a fire. 
such a horrendous matter, such a horrendous torture that, that's taken place. But what's really kind of beautiful in the, in the midst of this sadness and this, this horrible situation, like I said, God Deuce talked about his marriage, how he would get married in three years in the square of Barfurush, in the square of Babul. And this is exactly what takes place three years later. Three years later, he's martyred and he's cut to pieces and he's thrown into a fire. Godus had the foresight to predict this, to know that this was going to happen. We then go on and we look at another battle <laughs> that takes place in the Battle of uh, Nairiz. And in the Battle of Nairiz, the, the protagonist there was none other than a guy called Vahid, Sayyid Yahya. And he was the right-hand man of the king and someone who the king had sent down to try and ascertain the validity of the Bab, whether the Bab was true or not. And Vahid falls absolutely in love with the Bab when he reveals this Tafsir Surah Kosa, this commentary on the Surah of Divine Plentitude. He receives this and he, and he absolutely falls in love. Now Vahid is the one who's the main protagonist down here in, in Nairiz. And we're hearing about basically a very similar thing that happened. History is repeating itself, the same sort of things going on. The governor, Zainal Abedin Khan, and his minister, Abdullah Khan, basically together, they try and go against, and they bring 5,000 people, and they start attacking. And the details are so, so plentiful in there, but because of time, I'm aware, I don't wanna go too much into it. The women in Nairiz were incredible. When people are attacking them, they end up cutting their hair and binding their hair to guns to try and protect themselves. All of this was about protection. They did not want to fight anyone, but they were trying to protect themselves. They're being stamped out slowly but surely. Bahid was so well respected. He was a Barbie, is now worth nothing. Bahid Sayyid Yahya was a Sayyid, meaning a descendant of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which means he had the green turban and the sash. His turban is wrapped around his neck. He's dragged. Eventually, his head is chopped off. And then women come from the town and they start dancing around his body. Can you imagine a decapitated body is there and they're dancing around the body of Vahid? We know that some of the other people there, the, the Barbies in that village, their houses are taken, they're treated horrendously, their nails are torn out. We know other tortures include molten lead being poured down the throat, heads being put in boiling oil, boiling water, some of them being cut in half, some of them being covered in treacle and being left outside for birds to eat them alive. Now this happens in every faith. The early believers are persecuted, the, the Christians were fed to lions, but the history is so, so heavy, so dark. And it makes you wonder, it makes you think, what was it? about these early believers? What was it about these Barbies who would give up their lives when they could just turn around at any point and say, I don't believe, I don't believe, it's okay. They stand up with their heart and they, some of them want, they almost want to die. We know there's, there's stories of people being cut, having holes cut inside them, candles put inside their bodies and you can smell the flesh and they dance to their death. They have this smile as they go to give up their sacrifice for their beloved. Things are really kicking off and it makes you ask the question, what is it as, as people who are alive now that we are not seeing about this incredible faith, about the faith of God, about any faith, the true faith. These are the motivating forces of these people. This turmoil, so ravaging, so distressing, had hardly subsided when another conflagration, even more devastating than the two previous upheavals, was kindled in Zanjan and its immediate surroundings. Unprecedented in both its duration and in the number of those who were swept away by its fury, this violent tempest that broke out in the west of Persia and in which Mullah Muhammad Ali Zanjani, surnamed Pujat, one of the ablest and most formidable champions of the faith, together with no less than 1,800 of his fellow disciples, drained the cup of martyrdom defined more sharply than ever the unbridgeable gulf that separated the torchbearers of the newborn faith from the civil and ecclesiastical exponents of a gravely shaken order. The chief figures mainly responsible for and immediately concerned with this ghastly tragedy were the envious and hypocritical Amir al-Sam Khan, 
the Mujada Dauli, a maternal uncle of Nasruddin Shah, and his associates, the Sajruda Dali Esfahani and Muhammad Khan, the Amir Tuman, who were assisted on the other hand by substantial military reinforcements dispatched by order of the Amir Nizam and aided on the order by the enthusiastic moral support of the entire ecclesiastical body in Zanjan. The spot that became the theater of heroic exertions, the scene of intense sufferings, and the target for furious and repeated assaults was the fort of Ali Mardan Khan, which at one time sheltered no less than 3,000 Babis, including men, women, and children, the tale of those of whose agonies is unsurpassed in the annals of the whole century. A brief reference to certain outstanding features of this mournful episode endowing the faith in its infancy with measureless potentialities will suffice to reveal its distinctive character. The pathetic scenes following upon the division of the inhabitants of Zanjan into two distinct camps by the order of its governor, a decision dramatically proclaimed by a crier and which dissolved ties of worldly interest and affection in favor of a mightier loyalty. The reiterated exhortations addressed by Hujat to the besieged to refrain from aggression and acts of violence, his affirmation as he recalled the tragedy of Mazindaran, that their victory consisted solely in sacrificing their all on the altar of the cause of Sahibu Zaman, and his declaration of the unalterable intention of his companions to serve their sovereign loyally and to be well-wishers of his people. The astounding intrepidity with which these same companions repelled the ferocious onslaught launched by the Saju de Dauli, who eventually was obliged to confess his abject failure, was reprimanded by the Shah and was degraded from his rank. The contempt with which the occupants of the fort met the appeals of the crier seeking on behalf of an exacerbated enemy to inveigle them into renouncing their cause and to beguile them by the generous offers and promises of the sovereign the resourcefulness and incredible audacity of Zainab, a village maiden who fired with an irrepressible yearning to throw her in lot with the defenders of the fort, disguised herself in male attire, cut off her locks, girt a sword about her waist and raising the cry of Ya Sahobazamon, rushed headlong in pursuit of the assailants and who disdainful of food and sleep continued during a period of five months in the thick of the turmoil to animate the zeal and to rush to the rescue of her men companions. The stupendous uproar raised by the guards who manned the barricades as they shouted the five invocations prescribed by the Bob on the very night on which his instructions had been received. An uproar which precipitated the death of a few persons in the camp of the enemy caused the dissolute officers to drop instantly their wine glasses to the ground and to overthrow the gambling tables and hurry forth barefooted and induced others to run half-dressed into the wilderness or flee panic-stricken to the homes of the ulama. These stand out as the highlights of this bloody contest. We recall, likewise, the contrast between the disorder, the cursing, the ribald laughter, the debauchery and shame that characterized the camp of the enemy, and the atmosphere of reverent devotion that filled the fort, from which anthems of praise and hymns of joy were continually ascending. Nor can we fail to note the appeal addressed by Hujat and his chief supporters to the Shah, repudiating the malicious assertions of their foes, assuring him of their loyalty to him and his government, and of their readiness to establish in his presence the soundness of their cause. The interception of these messages by the governor and the substitution by him of forged letters loaded with the abuse which he dispatched in their steed to Tehran the enthusiastic support extended by the female occupants of the fort, the shouts of exultation which they raised, the eagerness with which some of them, disguised in the garb of men, rushed to reinforce its defenses and to supplant their befallen brethren, while others ministered to the sick and carried on their shoulders skins of water for the wounded. And still others, like the Carthaginian women of old, cut off their long hair, and bound the thick coils around the guns to reinforce them. The foul treachery of the besiegers, who on the very day they had drawn up and written out an appeal for peace, 
and enclosing with it a sealed copy of the Quran as a testimony of their pledge, had sent it to Hujat, did not shrink from throwing into a dungeon the members of the delegation, including the children, which had been sent by him to treat with them, from tearing out the beard of the venerated leader of that delegation and from savagely mutilating one of his fellow disciples. We call to mind, moreover, the magnanimity of Hujat, who though afflicted with the sudden loss of both his wife and child, continued with unruffled calm in exhorting his companions to exercise forbearance and to resign themselves to the will of God until he himself succumbed to a wound he had received from the enemy, the barbarous revenge which an adversary incomparably superior in numbers and equipment wreaked upon its victims, giving them over to a massacre and pillage, unexampled in scope and ferocity, in which a rapacious army, a greedy populace, and an unappeasable clergy freely indulged. The exposure of the captives of either sex, hungry and ill-clad, during no less than 15 days and nights to the biting cold of an exceptionally severe winter, while crowds of women danced merrily around them, spat in their faces and insulted them with the foulest invectives. The savage cruelty that condemned others to be blown from guns, to be plunged into ice cold water and lashed severely, to have their skulls soaked in boiling oil, to be smeared with treacle and left to perish in the snow. And finally, the insatiable hatred that impelled the crafty governor to induce, through his insinuations, the seven-year-old son of Hujat to disclose the burial place of his father, that drove him to violate the grave, disinter the corpse, ordered to be dragged to the sound of drums and trumpets through the streets of Zanjan, and be exposed for three days and three nights to unspeakable injuries. These and other similar incidents connected with the epic story of the Zanjan upheaval, characterized by Lord Curzon as a terrific siege and slaughter, combined to invest it with a somber glory, unsurpassed by any episode of a like nature in the records of the heroic age of the faith of Baha'u'llah. The third and final battle that we're talking about is in Zanjan. Zanjan, which is all the way up here. The main two people in Zanjan, obviously Hojat, this remarkable, remarkable character who was very strong, who had a lot of problems with some of the teachings that were around and phenomenal at debating and trying to understand things. He falls in love with the bar. He's there in Zanjan, and it's said that there's almost half the town of Zanjan were Babis. People were very much on his side. Amir Aslan, who was the maternal uncle of Nasruddin Shah, who was a governor there, I believe, he was in charge and was trying to wipe things out and was speaking to Nasruddin Shah, getting the uh, approval to actually go after the Barbies. A town crier then went round and ringing a bell, basically saying, look, if you're a Barbie, you're going to be dead and you're going to get beaten. So they had to decide where they went. Sometimes families that were split apart, fathers and, and sons that were split, because some people believed in the Bab, some people didn't. But they went to this fort of Ali Maradan. It said that there's 3,000 Babis that are actually inside these forts. Hojat told them, listen, we must behave well. We must uh, do all we can. We love Iran. We love this country. We love the faith of Islam. The way in which we behave is paramount. They tried attacking the fort of Ali Maradan so much that the Sadr one of the military leaders, is sacked because he's not able to attack these people. These trained killers are not able to really crush them. We then hear about Zainab, and Zainab, oh, what an incredible, incredible lady. And I think she was the uh, sister-in-law of Hojat. Zainab was given the title Rastam Ali, which is the name of a, a Pahlavun, you'll say, for I see this uh, character who was very strong, and she is the one who cut her hair and disguised herself to be a man. And they would go out and they would shout out, Ya Sahaba Zaman, calling, invoking the name of the Bab. And Zainab was found to be a woman. She was incredible and people were scared of her. So much so that her shouts would terrify the enemy. We hear about the, the governors and all the military that were against them. They were involved in drinking, gambling, all sorts of things. Craziness that would ensue. And then you had the Babis here, who with absolute purity of heart, would try and go about their business and just try and get enough food. 
many times they would invoke the name of the Lord, people would run away. There's a letter that's written to the to the government by Hojak saying, look, we want to help Iran progress. We're, we're totally on board. We're not against you, blah, blah, blah. But this was, this was basically incepted. And then this was changed. Women were so proactive, again, up in Zanjan, as we see from the, the example of Zainab. Um, we know that Hojak's wife and child are killed while he's in that fort. But he is still so much composure that he, he still keeps his calm. And he's still saying, let's just believe in the will of God. Let's go forward. Eventually, Hojad is killed, the body is buried, they get his seven-year-old son, and they say to him, look, we want to give your dad a good send-off. We, we, we like your dad. No, there's no problems here. And they persuade his seven-year-old son to tell them where the body was. They dig up this body. They drag it through the streets, and there were drums and trumpets. They're playing around, celebrating the death of Hojad. His body is left for three days and three nights. Eventually, things come to a close. This is a, a brief overview. There's so much detail in it, but it really leaves us with the question, what were they seeing? Why were they able to give that full sacrifice for this? At any point, they could have turned around and said, we are not Barbies. This is not what we want to do. Ja oman sisimpääni ikuisuuteen, verhoutuneena tunsin rakastavani sinua. Siksi minä loin sinut ja kaiversin oman kuvani sinuun. Ja paljastin sinulle kauneuteni vahaa.